Good evening, everyone. Um, you're very welcome. Thank you all for coming along to this annual event, jointly organised by the, so the Social Research Association, of which I am a co-chair, and the Royal Statistical Society. Um, this lecture is held in honour of Cathy Marsh, who I'm sure you've all heard of and are familiar with. She was an exceptional quantitative researcher who died in 1993. She's also recognised by the Cathy Marsh Institute for Social Research at the University of Manchester. So tonight our topic, as you can see, is cost, speed, quality. Two out of three ain't bad, or is it? Um, we've got five fantastic speakers. Um, I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to hand over to them. They'll introduce themselves more fully, um, and then afterwards we'll make sure we have some time for Q&A. So this evening we have Guy Goodwin from Natsen, Laura Wilson and Andrew Phelps, both from the ONS. We've got Sam Clemens from Ipsos, and Ed Dunn from Cantar Public. <coughs> Um, very last few things I need to say. Um, this lecture is being filmed and the Q&A will be as well. Um, there are no fires, there are no fires planned, there <laughs> are no tests of the fire system planned for this evening. So if you do hear a fire alarm, um, please exit either of those doors and the staff said essentially follow them down and out. Um, we'll, the plan for this evening is so we'll have four roughly 15 minute talks and then after that we should have 20-ish minutes for Q&A. We'll bring everybody up at that point to do that. And then you're all invited to join us downstairs for drinks in the council chamber. Thank you very much. On that note, I'll hand over to Guy. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Cathy Marsh Lecture. I'm Guy Goodwin, and I'm currently the CEO at the National Centre for Social Research, NatSEN. And it's a great privilege to be opening uh, this session. Um, Cathy, of course, some of you uh, will have known her well. I didn't. I believe I met her once. Um, but clearly she was uh, seen as a force of nature, a believer in evidence and in uh, surveys. And she also believed passionately in rational thought, logic and arguments at a time, I guess, when public discourse can appear rather irrational and territorial, especially on, on social media. And as an evidence-based community, we become vulnerable, I guess, at such times, but I also think it's a time when we should reinforce sticking with the evidence about what does and doesn't work underpinned by our independence and our high-quality, rigorous methods. So I've been asked to say, lob up a few thoughts uh, by way of introduction on this topic, on this title of cost, speed, quality. Two out of three ain't bad, or is it? Which sounds like one of these which is designed to get people in the room. And I guess my first thought was I didn't like the title. Um, I, I'm a statistician by training, so I was brought up with a much wider definition of quality. Um, and I'm going to read these out, but you know, quality in my mind equals relevance, accuracy, reliability, Timeliness, punctuality, coherence, comparability, accessibility, and clarity. And those are the nine Eurostat dimensions um, of, of quality. Um, and I think the author of the title of this probably meant accuracy or something similar, uh, not quality. Um, and yes, I suspect my first thought is that there is a discussion to be had about the trade-offs between the dimensions, the quality dimensions, uh, including between accuracy and timeliness, but also uh, the others too. So that was my first thought, just to lob that up in, in the air. The second thought I had was that the most important data in some ways that we've been collecting in the last couple of years during the pandemic are surely the data on COVID-19. Um, and that includes the very basic counts on the prevalence and impact of COVID-19, the effectiveness of the vaccinations and so on. And at the forefront, I guess, in those data were the administrative counts of cases of hospitalizations and deaths, the ONS COVID infection study, and the REACT study, and Sam uh, from Ipsos will say a little bit about that study later. And so note one to self, at this time of pandemic, we fell back on multiple sources. Uh, just like I guess increasingly we are using multiple sources on labor market statistics, economic population statistics, and so on, to best explain what's happening. 
The future may well, as many of you have suggested in the past, be multi-source. And I guess it can also be said we had some form of triangulation and confidence came when those three sources we were using were all moving in the same direction. Note two to self. Um, the position and importance of the survey during the pandemic seemed to me to be consolidated. The National Statistician, rightly in my view, made the COVID-19 infection study the gold standard data collection and insisted on it being effectively a face-to-face -face study because we had to have the most accurate data on prevalence. Why weren't the administrative sources sufficient? Well, we all saw why not. I mean, the hospitalisation and deaths, perhaps, and perhaps turning points in numbers of cases, the admin uh, data could tell us. But they couldn't tell us how many people had the virus, because a large number of us had it without symptoms. And we know, particularly on the health field, that these, this is not uncommon, that administrative data can't collect how many of us are everything from obese to having poor mental health. And also, rather irritatingly, the number of cases, of course, when they were going up, started increasing faster because we all started testing ourselves just in case um, we had COVID. And then when they started going down again, we all stopped testing ourselves and therefore it, um, it escalated the fall. So the administrative data did what they do. I mean, these are not new deficiencies. And I guess where was the social media data word cloud when you most needed it? Did anyone see it? So note to self, survey position reinforced. But then note to self that if we look across those multiple sources in, com in combination, they were of sufficient accuracy in my view. There were weaknesses in all three. I'm not an expert in all three, but I can see weak weaknesses in all three types of sources. They were timely enough. I wish the ONS data were a bit quicker, um, but they, it was pretty good. They were highly relevant, and although the cost, I mean, I've heard people say the cost of the COVID collection was astronomical, um, but the Treasury paid for it. And, and, you know, who knows, they would have probably paid twice, three, four, five times it, uh, because it was highly relevant uh, data. And so there is an argument that actually we met all three, not just two for those key data. Third thought, we know that surveys that change data collection modes get discontinuities, some of them really sizable. The data can be misleading. We've got examples in, in past history. We know there can be stark differences in opinion polls collected in different modes. There have been a few Sturgis reviews to remind us of those limitations. And we know panels can get improved results if you add offline modes. So we've done a heap of surveys and panels on top of the main COVID collections uh, surveys during this period, and including so-called not-to-nudge video interviewing and so on. And what have we really learned about accuracy? Do we have the foggiest idea of their accuracy? I mean, I hear people saying, oh, well, the data look okay. Well, that's good. There have been a few um, uh, studies, individual studies, but are they brought together and uh, in one place? And, you know, do we really know across the board what discontinuities have happened? I mean, there are GSS reports out there saying basically um, there may well be a discontinuity, but not really telling us by how much. So I worry a little bit when we say time for change. You know, society is changing. Do we want interviewers driving around everywhere? Can we afford face-to-face? -face? Uh, there might be other pandemics. I mean, I understand all those arguments, but do we know, really know about accuracy? And we'll be hearing from Laura, Andrew and Sam. They'll be touching on some areas of 
uh, accuracy in their talks. But we, I suspect, need a systemic, systematic way to judge when to change survey modes based on evidence and things like the remodel approach being promoted by Peter Cornick and others is, of course, one way to independently uh, assess, assess that. So I think on the other surveys, the jury is to a degree out on accuracy, and we may argue that two out of three is bad, ain't bad. Um, who knows? A, a fourth thought. Ongoing surveys of all types must simply be more quickly turned around for commissioners. I've been saying this for a few years now, and I think the pandemic shows we can do it. There may be constraints. I know Charles Lowndes um, at ONS, one of my former colleagues, talks about technical deficit and so on and how unusual the pandemic was. But really, sort of a year, two years to turn around a survey in 2023, we really should be able to turn around surveys quicker. There's nothing fundamental if a face-to-face -face interviewer types something into a computer or if we type something into a, a website or if we type something into an administrative database, uh, the technology doesn't prevent that data from going immediately to the person analyzing it. So why does it, why does it need to take uh, as long as it does? I suspect all surveys should be turned around within six months of the end of the field work as a maximum. Fifth thought, UKRI and ESRC uh, there is a call for methods and analytical work to help shift the dial on um, offering a suite of products for commissioners of different modes. I'll admit when I saw it, I was delighted to see it, but I did query with uh, Jerry Nicholas, my colleague, whether they had missed a naught out on the £3 million budget they had um, uh, allocated. Um, if you think about how much UKRI and ONS over the years has spent on its branding, sorry to people in the room, websites, logos and so on, uh, you would think that data really is very, very important and is 3 million really going to crack this? I hope we can look at things innovatively and avoid the same old, old on whoever eventually emerges from the UKRI uh, process. I think it's an important time. I sense that the rhetoric, the sort of spin people tell us to change, and belief-driven people tell us to change, but has the pandemic really changed the scales in a, a factual way, and how do we know? And certainly, I think we can have more confidence in producing things quicker, but where are we on accuracy? And we should not be timid in pushing back in arguing our business cases for quality research and evidence. I think we need better data. That's me done. I'm handing over to Laura and Andrew. So hi everyone, welcome, I'm Laura Wilson, I'm a Principal Researcher in the UK Government Data Quality Hub. I'll begin by giving an overview and introduction to our talk. So it is one of two halves and I begin by sharing the shifts that we've observed um, in the data collection space as a community, so not just ONS since the pandemic began and Andrew will follow on and talk about what's next. So I think we can all agree that the pandemic imposed a stage of evolution on survey design and development and some people think that some of these changes have been good and some people think that some of these changes have been bad. I think we've got the right people in the room tonight to have a good debate on this topic. Um, so today is an opportunity for us to surface the shared concerns and conversations that have been happening across the industry on this topic and my talk is really about representing those cross-sector views. During the pandemic, no one's going to question it. It was totally right that we prioritised pace, and that was the priority. Um, but 
Um, that, that way of working has sustained since we've emerged from the pandemic and it's now beginning to permeate into the way that we design and deliver the rest of our surveys. And this poses a risk to quality. A view that I share with many others is that this way of working is no longer necessary as we're not working in an emergency state. Instead, now is the time to actually refocus on quality and reintroduce some of those good practices that were lost during the pandemic. We must remember that quality begins at the beginning of the data life cycle and in order to avoid the rubbish in equals rubbish out scenario, um, that we need to refocus more efforts and resources at the start. So I'll now talk quickly about some of the shifts that we've observed in the data collection space. So firstly, we saw a shift to the rapid gathering of survey requirements, and this posed many challenges to those working on the design and delivery of surveys. <coughs> um, there are many risks associated with this way of working, Firstly, being that the wrong question could be designed as the spec lacks precision, detail and clarity, and in turn this could risk the wrong data being collected for the customer. There could also be unintended breaks in the time series, as things may not have been fully considered and fixes may be needed later, and the designs may not be future-proofed as the opportunity to do that thinking may not have happened. All of these things then have the potential to go on and damage our customer relationships. The second shift that we've seen um, was either the loss or reduction in qualitative pre-testing. And for those of you who know me, you know I'm a qualitative researcher, so this is very close to my heart. Um, there are also risks associated with working in this way, mainly being that we're not able to design respondent-centred surveys when we do this. And that means that we risk <coughs> sorry, collecting the wrong questions, um, designing the wrong questions, getting the wrong data, and creating a poor respondent experience. A poor respondent experience then leads to increase in respondent burden, attrition and item missingness, and that leads to redu reduction in data quality. Also, not being able to understand how a respondent interprets the questions makes it much harder to understand any changes that we then later see in the data. The third shift that we've seen is that there's been a reduction or loss in quantitative pre-testing. Again, this carries risks, so overall it poses a threat to the successful delivery of our surveys and therefore us achieving our survey goals. Our learning gets delayed as it only begins once we go live, therefore there's no chance to fix any issues in advance of us actually getting the data. And there's an increased risk in multiple breaks of the time series. For example, we may need to retrospectively fix issues that appear once we've gone live. So a combined consequence of all of these things means that we've ended up with something that I'm terming the messy middle when it comes to survey production. And by this I mean we've become extremely reliant and dependent upon the middle of the data life cycle, so that's the cleaning, editing and imputation phases, in order to achieve quality. Whereas in contrast it should be every part of the data life cycle that plays its role in that. This way of working is also part of a wider cultural problem, and that was noted by the Public Accounts Committee recently. They identified that there's an acceptance of a culture of workarounds and that needs to change. So there's also risks of working with a messy middle. <laughs> Doesn't sound very nice. Um, so one of those is that we need to extend the delivery timelines as this phase may now need longer to complete. These methods are being pushed to do more than they were ever originally designed to do or intended to do. Um, so that may mean we need to manage expectations with our customers and also new methods may need to be created. There's also a lack of resource to do this work, as it's intensive and time-consuming, and it's also very highly skilled. There's also more chance of human error due to vague requirements and increased demand, and this leads to a really pressured work environment for those doing that work. So I'll now conclude my part of the talk and say that it's important not to forget that in working in this way, we're still spending time and money, but we're doing so in a different part of the data life cycle. So why can't we shift some of that effort to the start? This leads me to also question whether it's appropriate that we place so much reliance upon the middle phase of the data life cycle to achieve quality, or do we need to rebalance it across the full spectrum? So I'll leave you with those thoughts and pass to Andrew. Hello, I'm uh, Andrew Phelps. I work within a central survey strategy team at ONS, um, looking to deliver um, strategic projects across the uh, survey portfolio at ONS. Um, previously, I've worked um, as a survey practitioner at ONS, uh, Natsen, and Kantar before then. So what happens next, or what should happen next? Well, the first point is that it hasn't all been bad. Um, there have been lots of positive opportunities have emerged for the industry. I'm going to reflect on just some of those tonight. 
Um, firstly, there's been a growth in remote uh, qualitative research methods, which have been que qu uh, che cheaper, quicker, involve less travelling, and been perhaps more inclusive. Particularly at ONS, we've been able to develop alternative technology solutions uh, at pace and um, acknowledge that not a one size doesn't uh, fit all. More generally, we've learned that at times we can do things quicker as an industry and take informed risks, and I think we've got an increased risk ap appetite as a result. We've learned that we can work together as an industry, and even though we might be uh, competing against each other on individual projects, uh, we've demonstrated in things such as the COVID infection study how we come to, can come together as an industry and deliver, and all four of the organisations speaking tonight uh, came together in that way on the COVID infection study. But also, I think we've seen uh, the industry working together on more common challenges like interviewer capacity in the last few years. We know that we can innovate at, pa at pace. For example, on most of the surveys that we've been working on, we've had to in introduce new data collection modes over the last couple of years. Um, So how can we reintroduce the quality conversation in all its multi-dimensional forms like Guy was discussing? Well, firstly, I think we need to uh, acknowledge that we need to, uh, the, the context that we operate under, there are still tensions between pace and quality and reducing budgets. And at times we will have to do things quickly. Ideally, we should be reintroducing more of the pre-testing steps like Laura mentioned, where we can. But if that is not possible, is that necessarily it? As an example, we could be thinking about more uh, retrospective testing or development, where we engage with uh, respondents real time during survey fieldwork periods or perhaps just after, where we can ask them about uh, the questions and the respondent materials that they've um, experienced and then iterate uh, post-launch of fieldwork to improve those. We could look at other evidence from uh, field parrot data or from coding and editing and have a, feed, a quality feedback loop through the end-to-end -end survey system. This does, however, bring challenges. Everyone needs to commit time and resource, including the commissioners, um, contractually. We need to be clear how we articulate the benefits to stakeholders uh, and commissioners of doing this, this kind of work. And we need to consider how this might impact on analysis. Uh, is it going to be introducing uh, breaks in time series or complicate analysis? I just wanted to share some of the uh, current activities at ONS relating to the uh, quality or accuracy conversation. So firstly, um, it's worth saying that our context at ONS has changed significantly. We are doing more surveys and we're doing more surveys quickly. And delivery and development of those surveys is spread across multiple areas of ONS. So we've been working hard to drive forward a common approach to surveys across ONS. And there's been lots of activity in the last 12 months related to that. Firstly, we've got a, an ONS-wide survey strategy and supporting principles for how we deliver surveys. And one of the core objectives of that strategy is to improve quality. We have a new survey best practice repository, which internally we call the Survey Playbook, which we've been widely promoting across ONS and has been very well received. And that aims to better connect people and knowledge in the survey space across ONS. And we're doing more to introduce measures to strengthen survey design assurance across ONS as well. So here are some further challenges for, for discussion perhaps later on. So firstly, how can we educate our stakeholders and help them recognise the, the benefits of uh, improved quality or accuracy in all its multidimensional forms? And how can we uh, encourage them to be aware of the risks where, when quality needs to be compromised? How can we feel enabled to push back, uh, say no or challenge stakeholders uh, with requirements that may risk quality. 
And what can we do as a community to help promote the quality message? For example, can we pull together practical examples of where speed to go live has created headaches later on in the system? Can we perhaps establish industry-wide framework or a charter with some common agreed principles? So I'll finish with a concluding thought. It's now the point where we really need to act. If we don't, might pandemic practices become the established norm and difficult to shift away from in the future? Hi, I'm Sam Clemens and I work for Ipsos. And um, at Ipsos I run the Probability Surveys Unit team. And that's the team in public affairs that basically runs and designs the sort of most complex random probability projects. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to look at some of the actual trade-offs that we had to make um, between speed, cost and accuracy when we were running the REACT study in the pandemic, which we did um, with Imperial College for the Department of Health and Social Care to um, measure COVID prevalence. And then I'm just going to look at where we are now in terms of those trade-offs and and begin to start thinking about things that we might be able to do to reduce the trade-offs in the future. So just very quickly to tell you what REACT was, uh, for those of you who don't know, it stood for the Real-Time Assessment of Community Transmission, and it was a study that took place from June 2020 to March 2022. Now I'm not going to go into huge detail as to how it ran, but the basic idea was we had a set fieldwork period each month where we wrote out to a very large sample of people. We selected those people from the NHS Personal Demographic Service, which is the list of people registered with GPs. Um, and we asked them if they would take part by doing a swab test. Those who agreed by doing a short online registration survey were sent a swab test in the post. That was then collected by courier. Um, people booked the courier online and it was taken to a lab for testing. And at that point, there was also a more detailed online survey that collected things like symptoms and behaviours for the participant to complete. Each month, around 100 to 150,000 people did a swab test for us. Now, the main driver when we were setting up React was speed. The data was needed really quickly after commissioning because there was just a need for as much data as possible at that point, so it had to be set up very quickly. But there was also a real need for as close to possible real-time data. We wanted the data, you know, the pandemic was moving so quickly, so we wanted that data to come out as soon as possible after people had actually done their swap tests. And while we collected a lot of data, there was really one key measure. Unlike most surveys, which have a range of things, the really key measure was the swab test result. That was the absolute focus. And as with a lot of the pandemic work, we really did manage to work at pace. So we had the survey set up and ready to go within a couple of weeks, which is almost miraculous when I think of it now, as it involved getting NHS sample, ethical approval, designing the recruitment materials, (coughs) setting up and scripting two questionnaires, organising print suppliers and setting up systems to work with a whole courier network and a lab and ensuring that we could send out the test results to everyone accurately and quickly when we got them. There's also a cold chain set up, but that's a whole separate story. Anyway, setting up a survey that quickly was unprecedented. We never do things that quickly. But we did it and it basically worked. So now what I'm going to look at is the corners we cut to do that. So, firstly, costs. Well, given the speed we needed to set the survey up in, there was no formal procurement. Now, as we know from the PPE scandals, that can introduce quite a lot of risk and lead to some fairly serious overcosting. Obviously, that wasn't the case here, I have to say that. (laughs) Um, But it was a bit different. We were a known supplier for this type of service. We were actually doing something that we already did for NHS England and the Department of Health. Plus, we weren't a fly-by-night organisation just set up. We had our reputation to consider. You know, DHSC is a big client for us, as are the other government departments. So, you know, we wanted to enhance our reputation by doing this. So we really wanted to show we were providing value for money. However, no procurement is a risk for clients and taxpayers. If, you know, if you don't do due diligence, there is, there could be problems. But it was also a risk for us as a contractor, 
We had no contract when we started. We had no real specification. We were paying out vast sums to our suppliers with no formal agreement. So there was a lot of reliance on trust and goodwill, which in the face of a crisis makes sense, but it's not a sensible approach, you know, generally if you want to make sure you're getting good value for money. And then there's accuracy. So I'm going to look at three main things where um, I think there was an impact on accuracy. So Laura's mentioned pre-testing. Um, now the main measure was the swab test, but obviously Imperial needed other contextual data to do their analysis around that. And at the end of round one, when Imperial looked at the symptom data we had collected, it became clear we had not collected it in the way that they needed it. So, for the analysis they wanted to do in round one, they couldn't really say anything about the symptoms as it related to COVID, which was incredibly frustrating. Now, the good news was, because the analysis was happening so quickly, it was realised, because we had a quick, a short gap between round one and round two, we could put it right. But on a standard survey, if you did your analysis a bit later, that could have been really disastrous. And then the design. We did online-only data collection, and we know that that can lead to biases, and we would generally recommend that some offline data collection is included. On the big push-to-web studies we do for other clients, like the Active Live Survey for Sport England and Food and You for the Food Standards Agency, we know that those who respond on paper are different to those who respond online. So we were always slightly cautious about the biases we might have. We knew our response rate was lower in more deprived areas. Because our sample frame had age on it, we could also see that younger people were far less likely to respond. And in fact, we, could, we looked at various things. So in October 21, we could compare the official vaccine data with our survey data. And we did find that we had much higher levels of vaccine to uptake, especially among the younger age groups. So there was these biases that we had. And we did manage to improve things in the final two rounds of our survey by using targeted incentives by age. But in general, across the life of the study, it was a concern. Now, obviously, we also used weighting to help with bias reduction. But on this study, Imperial needed to report on the data. As soon as the field worker finished, they literally would report the next day. And sometimes they wanted to report halfway through the field work period when things were moving particularly quickly in terms of the pandemic. So to have the weights ready in time, we waited using the registration data rather than the final swab data. Now, it probably didn't make a huge difference, but again, for bias reduction, you would ideally use that final data. So overall, the quality was good enough. The accuracy was good enough. It certainly let us look at trends and how things were moving in the pandemic. And we managed to do it so that we were pretty much real time. You know, the data was coming out a few days after it had been collected. But we know the results are likely to underestimate prevalence. So speed did lead to a bit of a hit on accuracy. And there were also, there's also other reasons why we can't work that fast normally. Um, sample access was expedited. There are actually new laws in place about how you could get hold of NHS sample. We got hold of NHS sample within a week. And if any of you have ever tried to get hold of NHS sample, you will know that that is just not normal. The ethics board were keen to help. You know, they assessed the study in just days. In fact, they were looking at documents overnight. Um, we also had staff available. A number of our projects had just stopped because of the pandemic. And the same thing for our suppliers. So we literally had staff potentially about to go on furlough who had time. And also we were in lockdown. Our social lives had come to an end. And there was this sort of massive goodwill and people wanted to be involved in the pandemic response. So people really did work above and beyond any expectations. And you can't expect that in normal life. It's just not going to happen. So post-pandemic, can we retain some of that speed while also maintaining quality and cost effectiveness? Well, I think you have to think about what level of accuracy you're actually looking for. Not all surveys will have the same requirements. And I think it is pretty obvious that, you know, high accuracy does correlate quite strongly with cost and time. But not, you don't always need to be at the top level of accuracy. So I think for any survey, it's important to sort of get a feel for where you need to be on that continuum. 
and there are times when speed, is, speed of setup is important. And there are things that are in place that can help with that. For example, some commissioners have call-off contracts in place, and that's where basically the procurement's done up front, and then they've got a contractor that they can call on to do um, smaller scale fast turnaround work. And that can work well because it saves time, although it can be quite a resourcing challenge for contractors because you can't plan for it and you suddenly end up with these projects just appearing out of nowhere. Also, as an industry, we do, in the last few years, we've come up with some good options for decent quality data collection that's quite speedy. I mean, there are now three random probability panels available in the UK that allow for fairly quick field work and data production and, you know, based on really decent random probability um, samples. So those can be useful. Generally, you need shorter interviews, but there are some decent options for very quick data. But if accuracy is still a key driver, then you do need to add time and cost. At the setup, I mean, I'm not going to go into that again, but as Laura described, making, investing time at setup is really important. During field work, time is needed if you want to improve your representativity. I would argue there's still a need for an offline mode. On our push to web projects, we still have around 40% responding on paper, and those people are different to the ones who respond online. Um, if you're using paper, you've got time added for scanning and merging all the data. It's usually good to use incentives. That brings in people who aren't motivated by the subject or altruism, <coughs> so incentives are important. If you're doing face-to-face, -face, you need a good call pattern over a period of time to make sure you're not just getting the people who are home all the time. So to improve your representativity, you need time. And then at the end of the survey, you do need time for the coding, making sure you get the weighting right. So you can't, I don't think you can match the speed of surveys like React, but then most surveys don't need real-time data. As Guy said, they just need timely data. And if you plan up front for your data flows and put in place stuff around the data processing, I think you can massively reduce the time it takes from the end of field work to get your data out. Certainly, <coughs> I say six months would seem more than enough. And I just wanted to quickly say, I think it is, accuracy still is important. Not all surveys need to be of the highest accuracy, but some do. You know, our national statistics need to stand up to scrutiny. You might, you know, if you're on, you need to have those ongoing trends. Everyone's talked about discontinuities. Some trends, it's really important that we keep them going. And finally, I mean, a lot of surveys rely on those high quality, really accurate surveys for their waiting. What are we going to wait to if all surveys are just good enough? So we do need to make sure some of our surveys are still very accurate. And then my final slide, and I think this feeds in a bit to what Ed will be saying more on, is as an industry, we are constantly trying to work out ways to improve that cost, time, accuracy trade-off. And Guy mentioned the UKRI call that is looking at ways to try and improve data collection. And I just wanted to mention a couple of my, my bugbears, I suppose. And the first one is sample frames. Now, most surveys in this country use the postcode address file for their random probability sampling, which is the list of addresses that the post office has. And if you're doing interview administered fieldwork, that is perfect. The interviewer goes along, they can identify which addresses are residential and occupied. They can do a nice random selection of all the adults living at that address to give you a good random sample of individuals. It is far less ideal if you're doing self-administered surveys where you're writing out to people to get them to go online or fill in a paper questionnaire. So if we do want to move away from interview administered surveys, we need a sample frame with named individuals. Now we have one. That NHS sample we used for React was brilliant. It, you know, GP registration data, it's probably pretty good coverage. It had name, gender, age, mobile numbers. Um, it improved the efficiency of the whole process. You can get better response rates. You can use targeted incentives. You can understand the biases. And you could select specific samples, parents of children, young people. So I think, is there some way we can improve access to those, uh, to that sample frame for government surveys? I think that's something to consider. There's also things around automation and working out a way that we can online get better occupational data collected more easily, for example. 
So I think there are ways we can improve the timeliness of data, but not to the extent of surveys like React. Um, that we wouldn't want to always work that fast because I think the trade-offs can be slightly problematic. Okay, so um, so the slightly bigger challenge than, than going last and running the risk of um, repeating everything that everyone else has said is, um, is is whether to say good afternoon or evening. It's slightly slightly awkward time, isn't it? So I was just going to say hello. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here, um, see so many faces, some familiar, some some new. Um, I used to love public speaking, actually, um, this, I feel quite anxious about this, and it all feels very new, doesn't it? And, and I think that is entirely symptomatic of the changed world that um, we're, we're living in, um, and I think really, really highlights some of the issues at stake. So my name's Ed Dunn, uh, I'm Senior Director for Population Studies at Kantar Public. Um, many of you may know me off of uh, ONS and um, social surveys and more recently the 2021 census, um, but I moved to Kantar Public in uh, November. I'm going, I am going to reiterate some of the points raised, uh, but I'm also going to introduce um, some new ones and in particular I'm going to build on the idea about how we can collectively and individually make gains on all of those dimensions um, of, of quality as, uh, as, as, as Sam uh, helpfully suggested I would, so um, that's what I'm going to do. But to start with, uh, repeating the point that Guy made, I mean we're absolutely clear that speed uh, isn't automatically a competitor to quality, it's one of um, the essential components. And as others have said, during COVID, the, the compass or target reference for those of us that remember graphic equalizers, the, uh, the bar on, on speed and timeliness absolutely um, was essential and uh, unprecedented. But so was our uh, response. In the most challenging and extreme of cir circumstances, we did and achieved brilliant things. Um, where I was at the time, uh, thinking very much uh, about how we got the COVID infection study up and running or whether we could and should run the 2021 census or whether it be in industry uh, with the examples that we've heard or across academia, how everybody responded was very much in the face of, of a national emergency. At Kantar Public we switched rapidly the crime survey to telephone so that we had insight into victimisation during the pandemic that otherwise um, we would have been ignorant of uh, and we switched price collection to an online approach which uh, the consequences of not being able to supply price information into inflation at a time of national crisis would have been dire. But like all the speakers have suggested, we, knew, we know that there are trade-offs. So we know that switching to a telephone-only mode um, suddenly the profile of respondents gets older uh, and we lose uh, many of the renters. Um, so, so people have, have, have seen that. We've seen that um, stated in, in many of the, 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 the quality reports. The pandemic uh, changed everything, um, including the reinforcement of the value of surveys at a time when very much the narrative was moving towards the more integrated system or whether indeed we needed surveys at all. But I'm going to argue that doesn't mean that we should restore the balance. So the pandemic um, did reinforce the value of surveys, but the speed of the world has entirely changed. There, look, there are always going to be new challenges. We now face the economic challenge, whether it be funding for our work or participants' cost of living. Um, there are always going to be challenges, and that compass of quality, as I call it, will continually shift. The pandemic forced us to do things differently. We need to maintain that momentum, and particularly, as Laura and Andrew highlighted, embrace the good, but reject very much the bad. So, I happen to know, because I was involved in some of the discussions, that the title has come because one of the panels is a fan of Meatloaf. <laughs> but I also happen to know that when the song was released in Japan, it was called 66% is good enough. That's a fact, you can Google it. <laughs> um, it isn't, um, and I would argue that we can 
and have to do better. Uh, and even though I know that um, I'm a social researcher, I know it should be 67%, so we've made um, some improvement already. So the challenge. Well, there's a few good things that I would suggest we can all do together. So I think post-pandemic, we need to get back and restore some basics. So Laura and Andrew uh, and Sam have highlighted some, some of them. Um, and I'm going to explore things where time can be saved um, that would lead to maybe greater timeliness, maybe better quality. It will, you know, it will, it will, it will improve the ability potentially to achieve all of the, the, the quality dimensions or potentially the, 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 the optimal balance. So I think we've lost our way on harmonisation. One of the things that I've noticed uh, since moving uh, into industry is just how difficult it is to find a harmonised set of questions, particularly ones that are up to date for uh, the multiple modes that we're working in these days. Um, a lot are still being updated, uh, or as I say, not up to date with sequential mixed mode approaches. So harmonisation isn't just good practice, it's absolutely essential. Um, I've been talking with clients recently about how we make use of the ONS transformation materials that are published on the website, particularly the use of different incentives, different envelope types, the design of letters, all of Laura's amazing work that she's, she's written about as well. Um, it's, it's there and can be used. Now I know it's not going to be applicable to every study and every different study has its, has its unique features, but there's an awful lot we can do to share more knowledge and in particular, what works that will save some time and money. Um, the recent UKRI methods call, Guy mentioned it, presents a fabulous opportunity to shape the future system. And system's important, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But what's especially welcome in there is the ring fencing of monies for secondary analysis. And I'm going to make a really big plea on power data. So irrespective of who the successful bidders are, we need to make sure that everybody's power data fe features in this, in this analysis, whether it, and particularly for my ONS colleagues, we've got some fantastic power data from the census on who um, completed online, but more importantly, who didn't, uh, and also some of the journeys for those that responded to sexual orientation and gender identity, which is going to become a really important feature of the future survey landscape. Um, the different respondent journeys that happened there, particularly whether how, how they answered things individually or as part of their household. And some of these things are just really, really important and we need to make sure feature in that, in that analysis of, of secondary data. Where we can, and there's a big dependency on systems and capability, we need to make use of reproducible analytical pipelines. And I know that's a little bit of a buzzword but it's where we made some big savings on setting up the COVID infection study at ONS. So we knew that we could save some time by reusing systems that had already been developed for the census for bringing multiple streams of data together into uh, ONS and delivering results in a, in a fast and timely way. Uh, and if we can do more of that and share the code uh, on, on the various, there will be people in the room who know more about this than me, but if we can share things, uh, we can do things quicker. Um, another area where we must make sure we keep an eye on is not just a race to maximise our response rates. We all know it's a challenge and increasingly difficult, but we must keep an eye on response optimization. So it's not just a race to who can sprint towards the highest possible response rate. We need to make sure that we've got an optimal response rate covering all aspects of society. Sam has spoken about sampling please, can we all try and crack the communal establishments issue? So we already know that we're excluding uh, populations in communal establishments. Again, sorry, because I'm using my, my knowledge. Um, I did warn ONS colleagues I would poke uh, in a few places, but we developed the best possible address list of communal establishments um, ever for the, for the 2021 census. It's already two years out of date, but what more, what use can, more use can be made of that? Um, and also, when the new system for population estimates comes on board, if it comes on board, and obviously there'll be a, an announcement next year on that, 
Sam touched on it, but what does more regular population estimates mean for weighting of the surveys? There may well be some improvements that we can make for that quicker turnaround of data if we can weight things on a much quicker uh, and more, and more um, contemporaneous basis. So whilst we can do a lot of things together, and if the challenge is good enough and great enough and serious enough, we know we can come together, we've also got to recognise that a great deal of innovation is driven through competition. And clearly there's a role for commissioners. It would be helpful if more people specify, I don't, know, I don't know the balance of the room in terms of practitioners and commissioners, but it would be really helpful if we received more broader information needs, not just specific survey requirements. So meaningful pre-market engagement will bring out some of those discussions about the tensions of quality, particularly if there's transparency on the likely budgets. Um, we can start those conversations early and take them all the way through uh, the potential contract and delivery. There is so much expertise and experience within the agencies. Let's bring it to bear and, 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 and get those discussions going. Let us act as trusted advisors rather than really tightly specified requirements where there is no room for manoeuvre or particularly innovation. It's not all bad news though, and there's some room for optimism. I'm leading a, uh, a, a new project uh, at Cantar Public with uh, clients in the Home Office that will deliver really important victims' data into the policy for uh, criminal justice. Um, there's some really sensitive parts to it, and even though there have been delays in the commissioning and award, um, at our first meeting, they were absolutely clear, and I've quoted them and, and have their approval to quote them, um, the design and development phase is there for a reason and we're not willing to compromise it. And I think that's such a, a, a welcome gesture as we enter this uh, uh, new world. So I mentioned this, this issue about a wider system. And the wider system isn't just about integrated or alternative sources for estimation or outputs. We've got to remember that there's a complex interaction happening. There's the interaction of research practice, whether that be materials, methods and modes of contact, or modes of collection that influence behaviours. But there are also wider contextual factors, and particularly if a big aspect of the future of surveys is opinions, attitudes and behaviours, we need to know some of the um, wider contextual factors, whether they be environmental, societal or political, that are influencing those attitudes or behaviours. I'd argue that some of the respondent-centric design uh, approach that, um, that, that Laura mentioned um, came from the challenge to adopt practices that were commonplace in the evolving digital world. Uh, and we really do need to continue to borrow from, from, from other disciplines. Um, the last time I was, uh, I don't think it was here actually, but the last time I was at a face-to-face -face lecture uh, for, for the Cathy Marsh Memorial event, um, Guy actually faced off against um, Tom Smith, who was director of the data science campus at the time, and it was very much pitched as survey versus data science. I think we concluded and left that there was room for both, but, but we, really must, we really must continue to embrace other disciplines. And actually, rather than it be surveys versus data science, let's join the two together. And I think the right approach is that is, 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 is using data science for, for the better of surveys, and I think it really can uh, potentially help to, to, to close uh, the gaps. Um, at Kantar Public, one of the uh, benefits of being a global social research world uh, agency is being able to draw on skills and capability from elsewhere in the world. And there are some really exciting approaches to blending data science and the wider con context of environmental, social, political uh, components that are influencing behaviours within attitudinal surveys and really looking forward to um, potentially bringing some of those to bear here. So finally, I think we've concluded that there are very many dimensions of, of, of quality. If we get the basics right, uh, post-Covid, let's, let's definitely do that, but let's not restore the status quo. We must continue to move forwards. 
We need those ongoing and informed conversations about all the quality dimensions from start to finish. Let's make best use of what collaboration can bring and let's make best use of what competition can bring. The role of the trusted advisor building on expertise and experience is really, really important. I'm really optimistic. I hope you all are. The most extreme circumstances drove us forward previously and I think they will again. So thank you very much. Oh, we do have some people. Okay, lady here at the front, you were first. Do you want to let us know who you are as well? Thank you Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, re really interesting uh, talks there. Um, can I ask the whole panel, actually? Um, so, on the three dimensions uh, that you've mentioned, is there a different way to deliver a census, or is there no point in bothering at all? Who'd like to start? <laughs> Sure, that's working, is it? Oh, it is. Okay. Um, is there a different way to deliver a census? I, I think you're going to tell us next year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I need to think about that a little longer. So, in in terms of yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I, I try not to try not to say anything that um, breaks my. Um, so I'm still, I've still got to abide by the civil service code for at least another few months. Um, the, I mean, I think it's, it's that, it's that balance, isn't it? So, so I, 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 I think there are, there, there are probably several people in this room that would have criticised their ONS for going ahead with a census on the relevance dimension, um, but we're clearly seeing. That some of the changes in society um, that people would have said were unusual are part of the status quo would be my immediate answer and and are featuring very heavily in um, how the world is returning to a new normal so you know many people said well the overseas students are going to be missing but last week we saw the data on uh, EU students and half of them haven't returned or something like that. I think it, it was that I read. Um, so I, I think the I think it's very difficult. I think it all comes down to the point that Guy raised at the very outset, which is what do we know, and do we know enough about quality, uh, and are we are we constantly and consistently reporting against those different dimensions? And I I don't know whether we are fully. In, across the different sources, but that's not specific to census. Uh, I, I'm happy to add something. I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, in the end, it has to be evidence based, Sarah, and you know, um, the ONS and the UK Stats Authority should be confident in taking that evidence uh, to ministers and seeking uh, money for a census if that's the uh, right approach. I mean, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I think I would have said by now I would have been, I would have hoped to have been convinced that we could do without a traditional census. I am not close, I'm not at ONS anymore, I read some of the documents that go out um, and what I read makes me unsure and nervous and I hope that we're not going to come to a sort of belief driven uh, decision that it really is an evidence-based decision taken within a wider population statistics system and you know what is best actually for the UK. Thank you, I think you had your hand up as well. Hi, I'm Peter Lynn from the University of Essex. Um, can I just start by again thanking all the speakers for a very stimulating set of comments. I think rather unusually, I don't think I heard anything I disagree with. Um, <laughs> I, I want to pick up on uh, things that um, Laura and Andrew mentioned, and if I misrepresent what you intended to say, please correct me. Um, but Laura, I think you, you asked the question 
or whether we should now be beginning to think about whether it's time to go back to reintroducing some of the standards and approaches that we had pre-pandemic. Um, and Andrew, you raised a very a closely related question but with a slightly different emphasis, which is whether we should be re-engaging with the, the quality conversation. Um, and I think, actually, Ed, you said something related to that as well, which was along the lines of we shouldn't be going back to the status quo, but should be moving forward. Um, now, I, I live in a slightly closeted world where I, most of my survey-related attentions are, are focused on just two surveys these days. Um, and I think both of those have gone back pretty much to the standards and approaches that they used pre-pandemic and did that quite a while ago. And I never noticed the quality conversation go away. If anything, it was made more prominent and more intense during the, and since the pandemic. Um, there were different things we were talking about, but the conversation was still going on. So with that as context, I want to ask you sort of on behalf of all four of the organizations that you represent, two things. Firstly, to what extent and, and in what respects is it true that you haven't gone back to doing what you did before? Um, and secondly, to what extent do you perceive that what survey commissioners are requesting, uh, what the survey commissioners' priorities have not gone back to what they were before? So I, I think, um, I mean, I personally speak within a specific context as well, so I don't see every survey across the entire industry. Um, and I have seen cases where um, things like free testing and piloting have appeared in invitations to tenders. So I, from my experience, I would say that it's across the board that um, we have to reintroduce the quality conversation because it isn't happening. But there have been um, some things that I have seen where it seems that things have been rather rushed in terms to get to field and it feels like the context has been, well, we've, we've, we've done that before during COVID, so why can't we do that again? So I don't think it's across the board, but there are pockets where that, that is happening, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think at Ipsos, like you said, Peter, I think we have seen the quality <coughs> come back and in fact people have been shown during the pandemic there was a loss of quality if we had to move to push to telephone or different options and a lot of clients were quite glad to get back to what they could see as better quality. I think what we are now seeing with inflation and government budgets is our clients are becoming increasingly nervous about the costs of those things and we are certainly starting to have to have conversations about how can we save money, can we do a different method um, and how will that method, you know, how much money will that method save us and I've, I think we're starting now to see that arriving, but not because clients aren't concerned about the accuracy of their data, but because they're on, they are beginning to be under pressure, and we're under pressure, we're having to ask for more money because of inflation, um, and it means there are now people thinking about ways to cut costs, and often that will lead to some change in accuracy. Um, I, I think even before the pandemic, commissioners were thinking a lot about um, the future of household surveys and which modes to use and potentially when to shift modes. I think there were already incremental changes happening before the pandemic. I think there are incremental changes happening now. My hunch is that they have got faster and that we're seeing more in contracts over the next period commissioners wanting to explore options for change, Peter. Um, that's one element of it. I'm not sure to what extent the... Um, we're not in a normal environment yet. I don't think... I think there's still a struggle around interview capacity across several organisations, including my own. Um, and I think there are open questions about how much response rates will indeed rebound and where we'll end up on response rates post-pandemic or whether there's been a significant shift towards um, away from face-to-face -face in terms of you know, uh, from a respondent um, direction. But you're right that many commissioners have been waiting to get back to relatively what, you know, pre-pandemic norms in many ways as well because of the improvements in quality and concerns around whether we really know about bias um, in the sort of temporary things we put in place during the pandemic. Well, 
else got their hands up? Pete Benton <clears throat> from the Office for National Statistics and Sam, the REACT study I think was fabulous as we were doing the infection survey alongside it, having that to benchmark against and the relief when we were lining up really, really mattered to, to under a lot of pressure. And um, you talked about the fact that you got it off the ground and actually, to begin with, you hadn't quite got the questions right and at the beginning it wasn't useful. My observation from being on the infection survey side um, was similar. There was stuff that we just got going. What, the point I wanted to make was there were some fabulous experts. Um, Professor Sarah Walker from Oxford designed the study overnight. She wrote the code to process it. It was incredible. In ONS, Ian and um, Laura did a whole bunch of stuff, used their judgment, used their expertise. I sent emails out, can I ask some questions on this? And they came back and we used them. And my reflection is those judgments from people with a lot of experience were very, very good. And there were some problems to fix and we fixed them as we went. And when you look at the IT industry, that gets a minimum viable product out, starts the website and improves it as they go. That's what you were doing on React, that's what we were doing on the infection survey. And I wonder whether that's a model for us. We've talked about the design and test phase being important, and it is, and depending on the accuracy you need, it kind of matters. But what's to stop us being upfront and saying, we are starting this thing early, it will be imperfect, and we will improve it as we go. It gives you headaches for processing, I know. But I think there's a, a place for the MVP, get it out there and improve it, particularly when something's got a fairly long life. Where's the balance of do it quick and get it out? Any thoughts on that MVP approach for a survey? One, one initial thought is I have seen surveys which are tracking trends where you are stuck with really rubbish questions because they were set up once and then the users of the data are like, well, we've got that question now, we have to stick with it, and we want to have it forevermore, even though it doesn't really work. So I think, I agree with you, there is a place for that, but we have, you'd also have to say, well, that might, that might mean we can't start tracking trends properly for that bit, those bits of data until we've got it sorted. And that can be something that sometimes can cause problems, would be my thought on that. I think it could be a possible model, but I think I would just caveat it, Pete, with the reason I was able to advise in those ways and to provide the information that I could was because I'd had the experience of doing in-depth R&D, and I'd sort of, you know, had the scars from it, had all the lessons from it, and I could apply that knowledge, but if you don't go through that in-depth experience, you don't have that to draw upon, so I think it's definitely a balance, and it's a bit of a plug-and-play depending on the situation that you're in, potentially. But I, and, I, and I think, Pete, that, that speaks to several points that, that, that I was trying to get across that actually there are there is expertise and experience across the industry that can be drawn upon very quickly. Um, there are things that can be shared more readily and openly that will that will provide a, a much firmer basis than a just kind of let's try it and see. You, you, there can be some reasonable um, confidence in, in, in something working and then I think it's all down to the two points that, that I was trying to make which is, are conversation and discussion at the outset whether that is whether that's whether that's in the pre-market engagement that then allows some of that flexibility to be written into the into the proposal um, and and then the, the point about drawing on the expertise um, the, 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 the wider expertise. So, um, you know, I think something like a, you know, something like an attitudes to, I don't know if there's anyone in the room that's just, that's, that's sort of working in this space, and I don't mean any disrespect, but something about satisfaction with transport or, 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 or something like that is very different to, um, you know, a study that I'm working on, which is, is victim satisfaction. Um, particularly if you're dealing with um, victims of sexual violence, they, you know, this, they, 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 it all, it's all about the, the, the context of this study. That's one of the points I was making in my slides, that I think that regardless of what survey it is, there's more we could do to learn from later processes in, in the survey and iterate back as part of a feedback loop. So I'm not sure how often we look at or speak to coders or editors to learn about the issues they have 
which may feed back into better questionnaire design. So I think even even if you do rigorous testing and going to field, there's still stuff that you can iterate back through. I don't know if we've got many commissioners in the room at all. I was just thinking on that question, because my background would have been more in commissioning than delivering the side. There's a danger that the commissioners think, you know, if you take that approach that, oh, I'll pay you for six months and you don't need developing it, and I can't use that for six months of data. So there does have to be a good conversation at the beginning to, to get through the benefits of maybe iterating and, and changing things and doing it like that. And maybe some of the data, you know, is lost or isn't as usable, and that that's sort of an accepted risk. I don't know if we do have anybody with that perspective. Anybody else got um, other questions? Pop your hands up. Gentleman in the middle there. Uh, Steve Woodland. I almost said ONS for a second there, but uh, Nat, uh, uh, recently uh, over to Nat said. Um, I suppose I'm getting increasingly worried about the narrative that seems to be growing over time about you know commissioners reducing budgets and the, the pressures on that. And I was kind of taken by what Sam was saying around you know when the React survey was being set up, kind of money wasn't really an issue. We were able to you know chuck money at it to be able to. You know, develop something that was good. You're, and essentially, what you're doing was minimising risk. So whether it's you know upping incentives or you know something which still comes back to me on a daily basis is about interviewer pay. That I wish I was getting paid what I was getting on the COVID study. You know, I don't get quite paid that. And I look over to my time associated with census, and a lot of the design, operational design of the census was about minimising operational risks and how would you do that by you know, chucking money at advertising to be able to get good recruits in you know, really doing good training and it was expensive and it's all about minimising risk and I just wonder you know, what the panel thinks about that because we don't really talk much about the cost side of it we're kind of presented with an envelope and we try and fit you know, you know, design, do our work to that envelope, you know, we've got that competitive environment. And I don't think there's enough of a conversation about that quality is expensive and actually just saying, you know, we can, we can deliver this level of quality for that budget, but if you want to get higher than that or you want to minimise the risk to reaching those levels, we need more money. It just never seems to be part of the... You know, part of the discussions. I just wonder what the, the panel think about that, particularly for the future, because we all know that departments and other commissioners are looking to tighten budgets. So, yeah, I think obviously quality does, um, it does cost money, but I think I'm quite interested in the link between quality and longevity of a product as well. So, for example, we've noticed that the stuff that we really invested in, in the social survey transformation space, is still working five, six years on. So actually, you know, that upfront investment was very large, but it was really worth it because we're still finding that you know, in 2023 these things are still effective. So I think for me, investing in that is, is really worthwhile because you then don't have to you know, reinvest constantly and try and find new ways to do things. So from my perspective, I think um, it's really worth doing that. Yeah. I guess it's part of that thing of the, you know, we've been talking about where you're looking at the trade-offs, and I guess... One thing that's happening at the moment is increasingly across all organisations, for example, with face to face fieldwork, we're thinking can we use it in a more targeted way, which means that we can pay interviewers more but not get them to do every bit of interviewing. And, of, you know, what is the impact of that and how does that affect the accuracy of the data? So it's probably how I think there's a lot of conversations about how we can use money more cleverly I suppose you know or how we can take the budgets that are limited and try and get the best we can out of them because obviously while we would all like to go back to our clients and say actually to do this properly you're going to need another million pounds realistically it's not always that simple um, so I think that's why we're always spending time working out these trade-offs and thinking about ways that we can make sure that like, the more expensive options like face-to-face -face are used in the best possible way to enhance quality after you potentially use cheaper ways. And I think part of that is having an evidence-based approach, so um, not just having a £30 incentive because it might increase response, but well, is, 
that may increase response, but is that increasing? Is that improving representativity? If not, mm-hmm. then there's no point doing it. So, is it, and, and also as part of that, sharing the evidence across the industry and publishing where we can. But the most effective thing to do is. I, I don't know what the dynamics are like. I mean, I've got two thoughts on this. One is I always remember as a, as a student when I was at the London School of Economics reading my Moser and Kaltner and things and getting to the point, um, Steve, where you, you, you sort of read through all the chapters and you thought, ah, oh, at last they've got to the sample cost optimization uh, thing. And it, there's barely any of it. <laughs> you thought, where's the rest of it? You know, so there is something about, and when have you ever used it? You know, and, and so there is something about that at a sort of um, a methods level. But the other thought I have, this isn't unique to surveys, is it? Um, and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a commission anymore, but I used to be, and, and none of us um, are in one way, are they, up here? And commissioners will have the answer to this. But if I look back when I started um, at the Department for Education and Science, and I, I must have been a bit of a nightmare as... Not necessarily a commissioner, because it isn't just surveys, it's the administrative data. I was always going on about things that weren't working and things that needed changing. And I actually wasn't just in touch with the head of profession. I was in touch with actually quite senior policymakers at the time. Now, I don't know to what extent that happens anymore, and how close the commissioners in the GSS and elsewhere really are to the people who influence the budgets or whether we're stuck within our statistics and research budgets which can be quite fixed and always you know, wanting um, them reduced and so on. And so I instinctively feel like saying to commissioners, be bold. You know, I mean, the pandemic shows us that if things are relevant, you know, they'll cough up ministers and policymakers if you're convincing enough and if you're in their faces enough. Uh, I just worry that we might not be. Uh, lady in the front here, and then also lady in the back. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Nicolas, Director of Methods at NatSEN. Um, just following up on that, I was recently, ch- I'm not a commissioner, but I was challenged by one of our commissioners, and it's quite an interesting uh, a challenge, quite a good challenge for us. And it was basically, it's all about this stuff, how to, how to make those trade-offs. And quite often our commissioners aren't equipped to make those kinds of traders. They don't have the information mm-hmm. that they need to work out. Is it worth sticking to face-to-face when it costs so much extra? If I move to online, I get a bigger sample. Maybe that's more important. How, how will these things weigh up? And I don't think as an industry we're, we're, we've been good enough in actually giving them the information they need to make those kinds of decisions. Um, and I just want to give a plug now for our next SDC Net uh, <laughs> event, which will be on the 22nd of March, where we're actually inviting some survey commissioners to come and talk to us about what it is that they need and, and, and how we can then um, address that. Thank you. Does anybody want to come back on that? Particularly? I mean, there does seem to be a bit of a theme from some of uh, the panel's contributions and some of the questions around like coming together, you know, quality standard, quality charter, so you're just sharing... Uh, harmonised questions, all that sort of, you know, actually we could probably make a lot of this better by working together. I appreciate it's also a competitive market. I'll just push yeah. on one thing. I, I mean, we're talking, of course, today about the quality of surveys. I don't think we talk enough about the quality of administrative sources mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a huge methods job if we're going to go into a multi-source environment around the quality of the administrative sources. And when we had neighbour statistics all those years ago, there was a lot put into quality. Uh, at that time. Now, Sarah and others who are going, who are set, you know, fair on this agenda, I mean, it's a big, big agenda. It's not just the quality of surveys, it's the quality of all of the sources. Okay, so we've got a lady back. If you could pass the microphone back, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> Sorry to make you run. Hi, I'm Eileen Irvin from Ipsos. Um, So I mainly work on health surveys, and I think there's been a real push that if something isn't real-time, then it's too late um, in health surveys. So there's been this real push of how can we make our field work shorter, how can we make our reporting quicker, how can we be as close as possible to the actual event. Um, And I guess it's been a real balancing act between kind of saying, actually, a lot of these things don't change in three months. They, you know, we can do a survey every year and it's going to look pretty much the same. And it's really hard to make that argument when you're looking at data that's changed during COVID where something's gone down 20 percentage points. Um, So I guess uh, my kind of 
question is around that, how do we have those conversations around um, the validity of data after it's been collected, that longevity of good quality data? So I, I, I just have a thought on this. I always remember doing a, um, a, a, a consultation on population estimates, which came up earlier. And uh, I was really surprised how some people, including, I, I remember this guy vehemently arguing, it, uh, it was from Hans and Spencer at the time, about the need for real-time population estimates. You know, what on earth for? I mean, you know, do you really think the population is changing that quickly? And poor Treasury and DWP and everyone else who have to change their models every two seconds because we keep changing the thing every day. You know, I mean... It, some social phenomena do not change that quickly. And of course the pandemic does play into this because during the pandemic, COVID was a bit more like the stock market, wasn't it? And in general, social phenomena are not. And so therefore we don't need everything in real time. So you just have to argue that and logically sort of say it to them and say, you know, what are you going to do with this? You know, if I change the population estimates every day, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, are you going to reweight all your surveys every two seconds? And, you know, it just makes no sense. You know, annual is fine. Trust me. Um, <laughs> Other thoughts, comments? I suppose building on that, there's, there's a diff. You know, that that, that might be a. I, I find myself agreeing with, with Guy for once, but it's <laughs> it's 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 there's, there's a trait there's a difference between statistics and estimates and and, and insight and I, and I think that's then where research um differenti differentiates itself from from statistics that that you can have the the hard counts and the estimates but you can also accompany it with insight into uh whether it's behaviors wider context uh that 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 you know, gives additional evidence as to uh, whether something is, uh, you know, you know what, the, what the trend might be. I think something, I think it's something you say, it, the qual is the why and the quant is the what, right? So if you don't, if you compromise on one of those, you mean you only get one side of the story? So I think there's probably something there. And I think there's a place for really understanding requirements. So why do you want what you want? What's the, what's the core motivations, and that might be wrong motivation or misunderstanding. Right, I'm just conscious of time. The lady in blue here has her hand up for a question, and then I think after that, um, you can grab the panel downstairs over a drink and keep pressing them. Hi, um, sorry to keep everyone from the drinks, but um, my name's Lisa Calderwood. I work at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies at UCL. Um, I just wanted to come back to this um, issue, I guess, of the kind of, um, kind of cost-effectiveness or the kind of... Um, the sort of benefit to quality and whether it's kind of worth the cost, the additional cost, and particularly in relation to sort of face-to-face -face data, data collection. And I wondered if the panel might reflect on the sort of... The, the, so we, I've talked a bit about the kind of cost, time, quality kind of trade-off, but are those parameters shifting? Like, I have the, has the pandemic shifted some of those parameters? So are we... Has there been a um, change in the survey taking climate where it's harder to get higher response rates? We've had a change in the profile of the interviewers. So is that going to have an impact on, on the quality? Um, the, we've talked about inflationary pressures or other uh, pressures on costs as well. So I think, you know, it seems to me that we're in a kind of situation where um, the, the cost of um, the higher quality data collection is is more is going up um, for per, per per day or per case, um, and then there's an inter the in, the quality might be going down because um, the response rates might be going down secularly across the industry. I don't know whether we've observed that yet or whether it's too um, so, soon to say. And we've got an interviewer panel who are um, newly recruited, so the quality also may not be as high as it was before. So. I just wondered, sorry, that's a bit of a big question to kind of end on, but I just wondered whether, um, I mean, I think that's relevant to the conversation around the, tr the trade-off, is that we're not going back to the pandemic because the industry has changed and the world has changed and maybe that's going to, and, and um, yeah, so anyway, any reflections on, on that? So, so I, I mean, I'd speak to the point, Lisa, about sample optimisation or res response optimisation, 
I think, because I, I suspect we could throw endless amounts of money to attempt to get back to where we were and perhaps not achieve it. Um, so, so I think it's about you. I think I think in, in, in that whole discussion about cost, it's about doing things smarter. So, so it can't just be a race to try and achieve the highest response if all of those respondents are the same. Um, we, we've got to we've got to work to deploy whatever resources available where it has the most impact on the uh, end, end result uh, and share that with the client as things progress and you know the point about real-time information or um, you know as near as, as near to it as, as possible as we progress through field work and, 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 and the development of the various dashboards and tools that we're seeing that will do that can can, can only be a benefit I think to that to that end I, I think I thought your assessment was very good Lisa and I, uh, the only thing I would say is it's not clear to me that it's in a static state yet but I think there is something, and that you know, whoever gets, assuming the UK or INES, I'll sort of point somebody for the um, methods work could have a look at some of that trade off because I think there is additional uh, cost and there are risks to quality and accuracy at the moment. So I thought it was a very fair assessment. The only thing I would say on cost is that, you know, as someone who during the John Major years did a lot of the market testing and so on, and in some ways wrote the first GSS Commission guidelines on uh, surveys and many years ago social surveys and sort of which led to the model that we've been utilising for ages. It occurs to me that interviewers are, in my judgement, relatively low paid and there is something about you know, are we into a race to the bottom here and paying people lower and lower? And yes, it does change the dynamics slightly, but is it time where we stand up and say that, you know, interviewers need to be paid at an appropriate level and not that they can just have further and more and more cuts and we can just say it's better public value? And I think that's an open question in my mind as to whether really it's that expensive in the bigger picture of things, not just our research budgets. Any final comments? No. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you everybody for coming. It's been really, really interesting this evening. Let's thank our panel again and then head downstairs for a drink if you're able to stay around.